Well, how many are ready for God's Word this morning? We started a series last week, a new series that we're calling Walking Through the Gospel of John. And if you remember last Sunday, we looked at how John, the apostle, answered the incredible question as to who is Jesus. And John did this so brilliantly all the way through chapter 1, that opening chapter of his gospel, telling us that Jesus was the Word from the beginning with God, who is God, who has been made flesh and has dwelt among us. If you weren't here for that message, I encourage you to go online and listen to it. We want you to be blessed by that Word so that you can understand where we're going with this whole series as we walk through the Gospel of John together. You can do that in your own time. Okay, this morning I want to start by going to the end of John's Gospel, the 20th chapter, to read a few verses to begin with, really, Because here, John states, at the end of his gospel, the whole purpose for writing his entire book. And from John's purpose, we see that he only had one aim. He had one aim for everything that he wrote in his gospel, and he encapsulates it in one word. And that one word is the word believe. Listen to how John puts it. In John chapter 20, reading from verse 30 through to 31, he says this, And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing, you may have life in His name. That's, John, that's John's purpose right there, for writing everything that he wrote in his gospel, for writing all of the 21 chapters that he brings together in his gospel. John wants to establish us in believing, And in that believing, he says, we might receive life through Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, that's important for us to notice. That's important for us to understand. John wrote, this is important, what I'm about to say, if you can can get it. John wrote about who Jesus was to establish us in believing who Jesus is, okay? John wrote about who Jesus was in order to establish us in believing who Jesus is. And that really is what Jesus, that, that's really what sets Jesus apart from any other person in history. We can read about Masses of people down throughout history who have done things with their lives through their time on earth. But you can only read about what they've done. You can only read about who they've been. But you can't know who they are. But John shows us how not only who Jesus was, But he wants to show us from who Jesus was and establish us in believing who Jesus is. So that believing who Jesus is, we might have life in His name. We're going to call today's message, It All Begins When We Believe. It all begins when we believe. And this is what we'll see all the way through this wonderful gospel of John. That believing, believing is at the heart of everything that John writes. 
Believing in Jesus was so important to John that he uses the verb believe 98 times in his gospel alone. In fact, many Bible commenters, when they comment about this gospel, call it the gospel of belief. Because over and over again throughout this wonderful gospel, John weaves the Greek word pisteo, which is tr translated believe or belief, into everything he writes. And this word believe that John uses is an all-encompassing word. He uses it over 98 times in his gospel alone. And this very word that John uses talks about an active commitment of trusting Jesus continually, moment by moment, day by day. It's interesting that John never uses the noun form of this word, pistis, which translated means faith. John doesn't use it at all in his gospel. Because John is not focusing on the moment of our confession of faith. He's more concerned with everything that comes after that confession. Only continually believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, do we receive life in His name. Now, all of us know the importance of faith. It's a vital starting point in our walk with Jesus. But John, throughout his gospel, is talking not about that initial moment when we confess our faith and start our journey with Jesus. John is going on beyond that, talking about a belief in Christ moment by moment, day by day. And as we do that and believe in His name, we receive life from Him. That's the message that John wants to get over to us through his wonderful gospel that he gives us. John is showing us that believing is not just a casual mental agreement to facts, but a commitment of heart and soul to Jesus continually, a commitment of our lives in all of its entirety to the one on whom We've believed. That's the kind of belief that John and every other New Testament writer calls for when they call us to believe on the Lord Jesus. Now, with all of that in mind, we're going to go now to John chapter 2. And just to summarize the events of that day that John records in relation to John chapter 2, Jesus, as you may know, if you've read John's gospel, is at a wedding in Cana. And everyone in this wedding are in high spirit because they're celebrating, as you do, with the bride and groom. It's a wonderful ceremony. It's a wonderful occasion. Joy and gladness and celebration is in the air. But suddenly, in the midst of that wonderful celebration, a huge crisis arises. The wine that should have been plenteous runs out. Someone had made a huge miscalculation, and the wine had run dry. And even though the party was in full swing, even though everybody was celebrating, even though joy was in the air, what was about to happen was that great humiliation was about to occur in this joyful atmosphere. And without going into detail, in Jewish culture, this would have been a great disgrace for this to have happened. This would have been a great tragedy that would have brought great shame on the groom and on his family. But Mary, 
Jesus' mother, seeing these events unfold and the potential for great disappointment and shame, believed that Jesus was the only one that could save the day and avert great disaster and great shame. Mary believed. Mary believed that Jesus was bigger than the ensuing crisis that was about to occur, bigger than the miscalculation and the errors that had been made. Mary believed and asked Jesus. She called on Jesus to do something, to change the crisis, to avert disaster, to remove the potential of shame and humility. She called on the one that she believed in. Mary believed. She was asking Jesus to do something that had never been done before. She was asking Jesus, her son, to do something that had never yet been seen. Jesus initially told his mother, it's not my time. It's not my time to do anything. But Mary didn't argue with that. Mary didn't respond to that. Mary still persisted, as we'll see, by preparing all of the servants with, with a word of instruction. And it's Mary's words to the servants that I want us all to see and take hold of this morning for our lives. Let me read them. Let's read them, her words, together this morning. Picking up on John chapter 2, verse 5, it says this, His mother said to the servants, here it is, Do whatever he tells you. Do whatever he tells you. It's simple instruction. Simple instruction to these servants. And I love the faith and the anticipation in Mary's voice. In the face of disaster, in the face of humiliation and shame, Mary spoke to the servants that day calmly and confidently, because Jesus was there, and she was believing that Jesus would do something in this impending crisis. Do you know, Mary could have said a lot of things that day. She could have used her words in all kinds of ways. She could have spoke out of fear, panic, and pressure. She could have become critical with that situation and started to point the finger and hunt down the person that had made the miscalculation. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to find out whose fault it is. We're going to find the culprit. Who's made this mis miscalculation? Why is the wine running out? She could have used her words in oh so many ways. She could have been angry. She could have been frustrated. She could have been critical. She could have been fearful, resentful about what was happening. But no, this woman was calm in a crisis that was about to bring great shame on the groom and on his family and bring this great big celebration crashing down. She was calm in the midst of this pending crisis, confident that everything was going to be okay. It was all dependent on Jesus and the word that he would speak. And she focused the servant's attention on what he was going to say and instructed them to obey it. 
Do whatever Jesus tells you to do, she says. You see, Mary knew that one word from Jesus would change everything. And that's why she instructed those servants in that manner. Before anything had happened, before any proof had been given, she says, do whatever He tells you to do. And these are wonderful words of instruction for all of us this morning, for our lives. Because in them lay the secret behind every miraculous work that the Holy Spirit will do in your life. Do whatever Jesus tells you will always lead you to blessing. Doing whatever Jesus tells you will always lead to wonderful provision for your life. It will mean His life ever unfolding in your life as you do whatever He tells you to do. This was the key to the miracle that day, the key to seeing disaster averted, the key to seeing lack overcome with abundance, and the transformation of water, which was common and ordinary, into wine, which was exceptional and expensive. So the servants, knowing that there was no wine left, were now waiting, waiting with anticipation to hear what Jesus was going to say to them. And at the beginning of verse 7, we read these words, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. Fill the jars with water. The servants knew that they needed wine. Jesus now is instructing them to fill the jars with water water. Now, for a moment, just put yourself in the shoes of those servants who hear that word from Jesus. They all know that they need wine. The wine has run dry. The larger gathering there have no idea that the wine has run dry yet. But everything is running on empty. The servants know this. And Jesus asks them to fill six large jars, each holding 120 liters of water each. Fill the jars, he says, with water. The amazing thing is, these servants don't object. They don't even question His word. Even though what Jesus told them to do defied reason, it defied logic, and would have been ridiculous to the natural mind, the natural observer. These servants didn't see it as ridiculous. These servants simply obeyed. They believed what Jesus said and followed that with their actions. They also, as you read this chapter, persevered. They persevered in their obedience because it takes a lot of time and repetitive, monotonous action to fill six stone jars full of water that hold 120 liters each. But back and forth they went, believing and obeying, because Jesus had spoken and told them to fill the jars with water. Filling those jars with water was a severe test. It was a test, a test of their obedience, that they had to believe and only believe Jesus' word to them. It was time-consuming to do what they did. It required a continual commitment to take Jesus' word to heart and to follow it to the full. And we can say that they obeyed Jesus' word to the full because 
John includes a little detail about the servants' actions and attitudes in response to Jesus' words to them. In the last part of verse 7, when he says this, and it's a little detail that John notices and wants to include because he wants us to see it. The last part of verse 7, John says this, describing their attitude of faith. He says, so they filled them to the brim. What a beautiful spirit. What wonderful words. I'm so thankful that John didn't miss that small, powerful detail regarding the servants' actions as they obeyed Jesus' words. Those words, so they filled them to the brim, really described the spirit of faith that these servants had, the spirit of faith and obedience at work in their hearts to obey Jesus. It's a beautiful picture of persevering faith to obey, to obey to the full the word that had been spoken to them. These servants didn't just fill the jars to 50% or to 80%. They filled them to the brim. All six jars, 100% filled to the brim. The message here for all of us from their example is when Jesus speaks a word to our heart, and we believe, we believe that word and we receive it, and we start to work it out in our lives, let's always give Him a full-to-the-brim measure. Let's never let our obedience be partial. Let's always let our obedience be a 100% spirit of faith to obey everything to the brim. Not just giving 50% or 80%. We want to be just like those servants, don't we? Called to do what we are called to do with a full heart and a full life. Receiving His Word with joy and seeing it produce much in our lives. Doing whatever Jesus tells us to do with the full measure of our lives. The filling of those jars for the servants was their opportunity. It was their opportunity that they took seriously. And initially, to them and to others, it may have seemed as very common and ordinary. But out of those very ordinary actions performed faithfully by these servants came the greatest achievement of their lives, the display of Jesus' glory and the provision for many. Out of the most ordinary of duties, out of the most ordinary obedience, just following Jesus' word to them, back and forth they went. Out of that ordinary action of filling those jars to the brim came their greatest achievement where Jesus added His glory and provided for everyone there. It's an amazing thing that Jesus would want our help, isn't it? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus requires our help. Jesus wants our help. Could He do it without us? Of course He could. But He never does. He never does. He wants and He waits for our help. He wants to see if we're going to believe, if we're going to respond, and if we're going to hold His Word in high regard in our hearts and obey it to the full. He calls each and every one of us 
to be his people, to be his body, to, to, to work within his church and work and serve within his kingdom. We want to give him everything of our lives as his word comes to us. We don't want to give him 50%. We don't even want to give him 80 We want to give him 100%. Brimful measures of our lives. You know, there's many people in this church just like that. Many people in this church, when I look at it anyway, just like those servants who served Jesus in that wedding at Canaan. They know what Jesus has called them to do, and they give nothing less than their all, week after week, month after month, year after year. They give their all. They fill their service to the brim. And When we do what we can do, God takes care of the rest. God does what only He can do. And His Spirit takes what we give and transforms our service into the richest taste to those who we are serving. You know, I was thinking about this. As I was thinking about this message just over this week, Faye and I have been married for 23 years this year. Woohoo! 23 wonderful years. Truly. 23 glorious years. And one of the wonderful things that I've observed over and over again in Faye's life is how she never does anything half-hearted. She can't. Now, I know I'm boasting about my wife. <laughs> but she's a wonderful example. And it's good to learn from wonderful examples, isn't it? She never does anything half-hearted. Whatever she does, she has to do it with a full measure. She has to do it to the brim, right to the brim. You can't say to her, oh, that'll do, halfway, do, halfway through what she's doing. Oh, that'll do. You spent enough time there now. That will do. She just can't do it. In fact, I've seen her several times cry. Cry her heart. Crying when she sees something done in a mediocre way. And she sees the effects of that mediocrity affecting a larger group of people. She can't, she can't just do things apathetically. She can't just do things in a, in a way that doesn't represent Jesus in the way that it needs to represent Him. And as I've watched, as I've, as I've observed her, I've realized that the reason why she has this spirit, the reason why there's an excellence within her that burns in everything that she does is because as a young teenager, she went after a verse in Colossians chapter 3. And she took hold of this verse. And she asked the Lord that it would characterize everything in her life. Life. Let me read it to you. Colossians chapter 3. And you may have heard Faith speak about this in the past. Colossians chapter 3 verse 17. 
It reads, it says this, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. That revelation burns inside of her in everything that she does. That's one of the reasons why Jesus Cares to date has received two million pounds in funding. That's one of the reasons why. Because of that burning spirit that whatever we do, it must, whatever we do or whatever we say, it must represent our Lord Jesus Christ. So I must give it my all. I must give it nothing less than everything that I am because what I do, I want it to honor His name. That's the way to live. That's the spirit that we want to have. Not giving a, me a meager 50% or even a meager 80% but 100% of who we are, giving all we are into what we're doing for God, to honor His name, filling every word, filling every action, full to the brim for the glory of God. Well, after all those jars had been filled with water to the brim, the last step, the last step for those servants came when Jesus told them to draw water out from the jars. Filling the jars with water is one thing. But to have to draw out water from the jars you've just filled and serve it to a thirsty wedding party who were expecting wine, and you know you're carrying water, is a very different demand altogether. But Jesus, the Lord of the crisis, Jesus, the Lord of everything, the Creator, hidden in flesh, tells them, draw out water, serve it up. Wonderful thing is, again, we see the ready response, the responsive heart of obedience, of faith in these servants to do exactly what Jesus was telling them to do. Allowing Him to be supreme in the crisis. Allowing His Word to be supreme in the, in the, in the problem. They obeyed, and they drew out their water, and they took it to the master of the feast, and then on to all of the other guests, and they all tasted the finest wine. They all tasted of the wonderful work and transformation of that day, because Jesus spoke and the servants believed. What a combination at work. What a combination. What a unison. Where their lives were one with the Word of God. They believed it. And then the transformation that took place and the disaster was averted. Because men and women simply believed heard and lay aside their own opinions, lay aside all of their own intellect and submitted it to the supreme Word of God, Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the musicians and singers to come. We're going to finish in a moment. To my calculations, you may want to check them, when you go home, but to my calculations, 
720 liters of the finest wine was made that day at that wedding in Cana. Wonderful thing is, even though it was the, was the most expensive wine, even though it was the most exquisite wine, Jesus didn't send the bill to the groom for the exquisite wine that he produced. Because grace never charges for anything it gives. There was no bill. Jesus' glory covered it all. Jesus' goodness and His love to avert shame, to avert disaster, to avert a crisis, covered all of the eventualities, all of the miscalculations, and He just freely gave, freely provided, without charge. It's the same for you and I. Steve spoke those words from the Word of God this morning that says, Ask, and it shall be given. Is there any charge? No, I've covered the bill. What do you need to ask for? But I don't know if I can pay you back. No, there's no repayments with me. Just ask, and it shall be given. Seek, and you shall find. But when I find it, and I realize it's so good, do I owe you anything? Nope. All covered. Knock, he says, and the door will be opened. Open to what? Open to a wonderful life with me. Open to my goodness and my mercy covering you all the days of your life. Opened for you to step through, on into, to see my provision in every area. But I don't deserve this. I know. I can't pay you back. I know. My grace covers it all. Covers it all. What a wonderful, wonderful Savior He is. Do you know what I love about John chapter 2? One of the things, there's lots of things, lots of different messages in that, in that wonderful chapter that we certainly wouldn't have time to go into. But one of the things that I love about this chapter and about so many chapters that recount how Jesus brought blessing into His lives, into people's lives. One of the things that I love about that chapter and many other chapters is that Jesus never, ever says, I'm the one who did it. Notice me. No, he just provides the wine. Everybody can continue enjoying what they're enjoying, the festivities and the celebration of the wedding. He averts shame and pain and humiliation. And after that work is done, on he goes. Discreetly, quietly, secretly. Nobody ever knew. Nobody ever knew. Until John wrote about it 50 years later. Isn't that fantastic? John wrote about this in A.D. 90, 50 years after Jesus had ascended into heaven, Jesus had gone and ascended on into heaven. And now John, as an aged apostle, the only one left alive, decides to write down what Jesus did and what he saw and witnessed. He wanted to show who Jesus was in order for everyone to believe who He is. When you read the Word of God, in essence, that's what you're seeing. You're reading about who Jesus was, but you're not just reading about somebody who was 
past tense. You're actually reading about somebody who is present, eternal, continual tense. He's the Christ. He is. He, see, notice his words. He doesn't say he was the Christ. No, 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 no. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And believing that, we receive life in his name. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word. Lord, some of us today have lots of different decisions to make. And we may be wondering what way to turn. We may be wondering how to make the decision that we need to make. It could be that it's troubling us. It could be that we're unsure or uncertain. We could feel pressured. We might want to impulsively go in a particular direction to change a set of circumstances that are out of our control. But Lord, I pray that we would take Mary's advice just like the servants took her advice. Do whatever he tells you to do. That we would wait for the voice of your Spirit who carries your word. That your Spirit would bring light. That your Spirit would bring instruction. And that your Spirit would tell us how we are to proceed in the decisions that we need to make. Give us wisdom, I pray. Lord, in our work, in what we do, whether it's serving people, others, in church, as your body, or out in our world, in our workplace. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just take 50% of ourself or 80% of ourself into work. Lord, I pray when we step into the office, we take 100% of ourselves into our workplace and do whatever we do to the glory and to the praise of God. That we would give the full measure, the full measure of our lives. Because we're not serving man, we're serving God. Lord, we would give the full measure of who we are. And whatever we do, we would fill it to the brim. Whatever we do, we would exceed expectation. And Lord, even if it's monotonous work, requiring us, just like those servants, to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, in obedience to you, where you've placed us, Lord, I pray that even in the ordinary, even in the monotony, you would show us that it can be most extraordinary because you take the ordinary the ordinariness of our obedience. And you glorify it with your power. And it becomes sweet to those that we serve. Lord, I pray for us as your people that in everything we do, in word or deed, it would bring glory to you. And all God's people said... Amen. Listen, why don't you stand to your feet? Let's have our musicians up. Come on. Are you ready to give God praise this morning? Hallelujah. Just be as they come. Let's lift our voice and give a shout of praise to God in this place. Let's give him praise. He's the one who speaks his word. Come on, let's give him praise. He's the one who speaks his word, who transforms our lives. He's the one that fills us. He's the one that takes control of every crisis. And we put our faith and our trust in you as our Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we're going to sing. Amen. God bless you Thank as you go. Jesus. God bless.
watching online and you said that you know you've listened to Dave's message today and you've been really captured by the word that he spoke at the beginning about believing because you've heard of Jesus before but you've never come to a point of decision where you've actually decided you're going to place your faith in him and believe in him you've just kind of allowed his name to be a conversation filler Today, right now, it would be my greatest privilege to invite you to say a, a short prayer with me, inviting Jesus to come into your life, believing in him and saying, Jesus, I want you. I just don't want your name to be something I hear spoken about. I want a relationship with you. I want you to be real for me. I want my life to be changed by you, and I want to live wholeheartedly for you. Well, if that's where you find yourself today, where you know you've come to a place where the other things that you've believed in, the other things that you've been following haven't really brought any level of satisfaction, any level of wholeness, any level of peace that you've been desiring, and you've come to a place of, and realization today that perhaps your belief has been in the wrong person, your belief has been in the wrong thing, Today, if you've come to the place where you say, actually, I want to make a decision to believe in Jesus and to follow him, why don't you say this simple prayer and just say, Jesus, today, I, be I, I believe in you. I ask you to come and live in my life. I need you as my Lord and Savior. Please forgive me of all of my sins. I want to live my life following you in Jesus name if you've prayed that prayer you've made the best decision of your life and our encouragement to you would be to if you're not local find a church close to yourself and if you are local we'd love you to join us at King's Church on a Sunday and have you involved within our church life throughout the week as well on your way out we'd love to give you with a Bible and also please let us know about the decision you've made see one of our team under the tiered seating and let them know that you prayed that prayer today you you can also fill in one of the um, leaflets that we've got on our seats, the yellow card, and let us know. And we can, we can do that journey with you and encourage you in your decision and in your walk with Jesus. Amen. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's Amen. message. 
If you have any prayer requests, would like to share a testimony, or would like to give online, why not head over to our website, kings-church.org.uk. If you prayed the prayer of salvation today and would like us to contact you to help you with your next steps, please click on the Choose Jesus button of our website. Remember, you can stay connected at this time by staying in touch with your Connect and team leaders. If you are part of King's Church and are not yet connected, scroll down to our Connect Online section and we will be sure to get in touch. Thank you for tuning in. We look forward to meeting with you again very soon.